we're going to call up the transportation and infrastructure asset leadership in practice panel. We've got Earl Jackson, the CFO from the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mildred is going to be back on stage. And we've got Dr. Amy Flannery, who was just at the US Department of Transportation Office of the Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology. She was a program analyst. And, and now she's at Jacobs. She's the global technology leader in transportation risk and resiliency. And she's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences Transportation Research Board. So she's uh, representing our uh, association theme all in herself. Amy has slides, so that means she gets to go first. I'm just gonna talk quickly through these slides. Um, in transportation, uh, we're starting to, uh, to see kind of a shift in culture and, and um, moving towards more proactive assessment of our, our assets and our performance. And I think the thing that I'm most interested in and have been working on research-wise for a number of years is resilience, um, especially from external stressors and from things like uh, shocks to the system, which is one of the reasons I ended up in Colorado is because of the 2013 flood event, which wiped out about $750 million worth of uh, highway assets. Um, I'll move on quickly. One of the things I wanted to talk about because about three months ago, I was in this room with the executive director of the Transportation Research Board, um, Neil Peterson, who's stepping down shortly, he's getting ready to retire, um, but also a number of people from USDOT and states uh, we've been working on in the transportation arena, trying to figure out, you know, what do we mean by resilience? And so I've heard that come up a number of times here this morning or this afternoon, I should say. And I thought I would just mention that um, we at USDOT uh, provided funding to the Transportation Research Board to investigate what do we mean by resilience and do we have a way to measure it within the transportation space? Um, this is the final product. Um, you can probably pick up a PDF version, but I happen to have a hard copy at home. Um, this product um, basically, unfortunately, comes to the conclusion that no, we don't have a way to measure resilience and we don't have metrics. That, that is an area that we're moving towards. Um, and it's something that uh, we're actually going to have a uh, forthcoming study in the next several years um, that's going to move towards something that you might be familiar with, like the um, Highway Capacity Manual or Highway Safety Manual. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but those are tools of the trade that we use to, um, to both teach these concepts at the undergraduate and graduate levels and then able to support professionals through their careers. Um, some of the things that um, come about within our industry, um, all the pushes and pulls you've heard about here this afternoon. When I was at USDOT, we dealt with a lot of appropriations language pointed at the office of the secretary that talked about things like resilience and measuring resilience and, and how do we do benefit cost assessments for resilient investments. Um, so there's a number of um, appropriations language, and then also in the IAJA for the bill, um, there's a specific section that talks to providing support to agencies to be able to do risk and resilience assessment of external stressors and shocks to the system. Uh, we also have the executive orders um, that were pointed at um, looking at climate-related financial risk and tackling climate uh, crisis at home. We had GAO audits of several of the agencies uh, that are under the purview of USDOT. We had this consensus study I was talking about, and then within our um, voluntary committees, especially we were talking about the um, AJE 30 committee, which is the Transportation Asset Management Committee within uh, TRB, we've actually put forth an initiative to, to conduct a um, three to four year study to develop manuals and methods and models and metrics to actually look at what do we mean when we say resilience and how resilient is our system. Uh, we actually um, at Jacobs have, um, are in the process of beginning a project with Hawaii DOT, and this is just some close-ups of some of the issues that they're dealing with in terms of climate stressors that I thought on a Friday afternoon, it might be nice to look at Hawaii, um, but they're dealing with things like wave action and erosion um, that is pulling away and kind of eroding some of their beltway roads that run around the islands. They also have had several rockfall events that have um, been traumatic to their movement of um, traffic around the islands. And so we're, we're starting to see states put out things related to um, uh, transportation resilience planning. And that's one of the things that's actually supported in IIJA is the use of some of the uh, funding for planning for resilience. Uh, so just a final note um, in IIJA, some of the things that, that we're excited about within transportation, um, we have a protect program uh, for the first time funding uh, specifically earmarked for uh, both in the formula funds and discretionary grants that are forthcoming uh, to support 
uh, resilience investments on the uh, transportation network, um, things like reducing carbon emissions with the carbon reduction program, and then the electrification of vehicles with the uh, NEVI program. So it's either some of the things that the, uh, the state agencies and MPOs are working with on the transportation side. I just thought it would help to kind of set the stage of some of the things that we're interested in and we're trying to move towards. Okay. That's great. All right, um, Earl Jackson, uh, CFO at the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, today is my nine month anniversary in this role. So it's been a very interesting, fun time. And then for the decade prior to that, I was primarily from uh, rail and public transportation with Mildred and team here uh, at the MTA, but also spent some time at uh, the Chicago Transit Authority and uh, BNSF Railway. So I know rail and transit very well. Uh, so Denver, uh, the story of Denver and asset management and asset leadership. Um, so you may know this or may not know this, but in the last dozen or so years, uh, Denver uh, was one of the largest or one of the fastest growing large cities in the United States, population growing by almost 30%. And so uh, for the better part of the 20 teens, um, a lot of population growth, a lot of infrastructure building. Um, I always like to say, and I've said this to a few people here today this time, um, Denver went from a big, small city to a small, big city. And they are coming and learning with the growing pains that come with that, right? We can't run a DOT on Excel spreadsheets. And so- um, But we like to. But we love to, <laughs> yeah. Or, or at least I don't love to, but they seem to love to. Um, <laughs> So um, the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure in Denver is a very unique one because um, after public safety, it's the largest department in the city. Um, in addition to your traditional uh, right-of-way maintenance, signal maintenance, bridge maintenance, uh, sidewalks, bike lanes, things like that, um, we also have solid waste management, wastewater management, and uh, we're the only agency in the city other than the um, other than the airport that has a construction charter. So if the police department wants to build a new police station, they have to come to the Department of Transportation to get it built. Parks wanna build a new field house, they gotta come and build, come to the DOT and get it built. And then we also maintain and do fleet logistics for the entire city, city vehicle fleet. So it's about five or 6,000 vehicles. So it's a huge department. So asset management and the way that we were sort of doing things in the past and how we've grown and added more assets and new bridges and new everything, um, it, it really no longer works. And so um, our department really has to um, change and evolve with the city as the city has grown. And I think uh, enterprise as an effective enterprise asset management governance structure uh, and framework and uh, transformation is literally gonna be the linchpin of how we continue to move forward and serve the needs of the residents. And so uh, here back in, what was it, June, I went down to the GF08 conference and met and saw um, Mr. Barnero's presentation. And I took that presentation back and I was just like, look what I found. <laughs> and, um, but nonetheless, uh, the, we've had uh, two prior false starts with uh, EAM efforts in, at the Department of Transportation for a number of what I think are the number of, a handful of reasons. Um, I think that there wasn't enough of the, the front end of things, the, the policy, the visioning, the goals, the objectives, and having it being sort of cross department wide across different functions. Um, that sort of thought work was not uh, done to the level that I think that it needed to be done for it to be successful. And it was housed in one department, even though we have uh, multiple departments across the DOT and doing multiple things. And so uh, that in and of, and then when you layer on just varying levels of understanding and or non-understanding of what uh, enterprise asset management is and what it means to the business, you layer that all on and it was just sort of a, a, a cluster. And so, and um, here in the last few months uh, being involved with uh, Mike and team and uh, a number of these other things, we've had a number of um, executive briefings that have taken place uh, to really 
expand our uh, senior leadership team's horizon on asset management. And while it doesn't have necessarily a uh, one size fits all type meaning, I think just really understanding um, the importance of this and getting it right this third time and how critical it is is going to be for us to do this to make sure we're meeting the needs of residents and that we're formulating processes in the way that we need to to ultimately get to the objectives that we want. So I think that still going through that process now, but beyond that, um, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, a lot of tug of wars and a lot of very interesting conversations, but we're on the front end of that third try right now and we're excited to keep going. Um, yes, hello again, uh, Mildred Chua Alger. Um, I am with Maude McDonald in the advisory space. Um, I joined them, I've been there for two months. So you're seven months in your role. I have two months in my role. I retired from New York MTA last year um, and spent that year uh, working with ALN and the IAM. So um, I kind of kept my um, focus on asset management to keep myself current and involved um, so that I can now move on to Maud McDonald and, and continue working uh, in that space. So really excited about that. Um, I thought that what I would do is react to some of the presentations that people have said and kind of bring some examples from the New York MTA experience. So I'm going to start with, you know, the infrastructure um, architecture framework um, that was presented earlier and how that was really, truly uh, a transformational tool for the MTA. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at Earl because you are um, looking for, you know, best practices and thinking of how you might want to restart your program. Um, the fact that um, the MTA, as complex as it is, was able to build something like that and continue to iterate on it, um, I think it's, it's a miracle, I think. But um, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, we have used it and I've presented in different forums on some of the benefits of that framework. Um, like we've used it to do um, workforce planning during COVID. All of a sudden, you know, um, you know, we were not going to work. Um, how the manpower planning process, you know, I mean, we had to throw everything out and we had to understand, okay, like what are the, what are the types of people that are normally out out there that are working, you know, and how, how do we schedule them? How do we do all that, you know, without your tools? And so by understanding sort of, you know, what are the key, with the key core capabilities of the organization that are now sort of lacking or missing because, you know, of the pandemic, um, we were able to use that, you know, as, as, um, 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 launch point for discussion among senior management. Um, the other thing that, that I thought was really powerful um, was uh, I, I was the CFO for one of the um, operating agencies, which is the Bridges and Tunnels Agency. Um, they were the first organization to actually go into a digital transformation. So they did a complete transformation from cash to cash to stolen operations like in 10 months. Uh, and it was a governor's mandate in New York. Um, we were scared to death. We were like, there's no way we've been planning for moving over digitally, it was a 10 year plan in the making. We actually were on a 10 year planning process and all of a sudden we're told you got to turn on in 12 months, which we are actually able to accomplish in 10. And just to let you know, the first thing we did, right, is to look at that capabilities model and say, this is what we look like. These are all our functions. Which are the areas of the organization are going to be totally impacted? We were able to do an impact analysis very, very quickly. Um, and then, of course, then program your, your manpower planning, right? Because as each, every month, one bridge or tunnel was turning live, was going live. So we had to transition our revenue management teams, our accounting teams, all of that. They had to do all of that work, right, for the, for the cash transactions, shifting them over to the cashless, making sure they were trained ahead of time. So this was facility by facility. But what I'm trying to say here is like, having a framework in place that you understand your organization at multiple levels, you know, your capabilities, what are your key business processes? What are the systems that you have in place? Are they integrated? Are they not integrated? What are the key pieces of data and information that you have that you don't have so that you can help, you know, transition and be more agile in responding to significant change? So that, you know, that implementation 
Um, most people, if you speak to anyone over there, will not even say asset management, right? Because that model was built through the asset management program. But even the way we orchestrated, for example, the committees for implementation, we had 15 committees, 15 committees, each dedicated to a different type of role within the implementation over that 10 month period, so that everybody was working in lockstep with each other. Um, so, and there was, there was like, I think 30% of the organization was, was working on the transition. The rest were business as usual. Don't think about it. You know that there's something going on. Continue business as usual because we had to keep collecting the revenue. Um, the MTA, uh, Bridges and Tunnels Agency, is the cash cow for the MTA. Right. And so we had to continue to generate that revenue. And I'm very happy to say that we did not lose revenue at all during this transition. We would continue to make our revenue targets, um, even given the complexities and the challenges that we had to face. So I, I brought that back in as an example of digital transformation enabled by having the right frameworks and the right tools in place, the right data information and so forth. So um, I think I wanted to just throw out a nice example out there to kind of tell a story. Yeah, and I think that's very good. Well, listen, Jay Walden wanted everything and everything right now, right? I remember Jay, oh, yes. Uh, Former um, chairman of the MTA, he hired me actually. <laughs> From school, straight from school. So yeah, I remember him. But nonetheless, I think that um, one of the areas that we've been missing that we're just now realizing that, oh, well, that's probably a good idea is the framework. Yes. Right. And not just thinking about it from just, oh, this is the system that we're going to start using and just thinking about it much more holistically and broad and processes and things like that to the point to where you can ultimately get to where you're not calling it asset management anymore. And it's just a standard Correct. way of doing business. Correct. And I think, you know, as the CFO, mm -hmm. um, you're bringing in the business perspective. You're looking right. at those uh, triple bottom line goals, right. making sure the organization addresses those, right? And then trying to build that alignment and say, okay, how do I connect all the way to the front line? Um, at the MTA, I don't know if you were still there when we were building the uh, performance management framework, oh, yeah. wherein the goal was that each level of the organization had a series of metrics, right? operational metrics, it, it, it started rolling up towards the strategic level. But at the end, you had a score for safety, you had a score for um, revenue uh, retention, you have a, a score for uh, resiliency, whatever those goals were. But at every level of the organization, there are very specific targeted metrics that the departments don't have to think about anything outside of that, but they all automatically roll up. So at the front line, it might be on-time performance, right? But then what does it take to make on-time performance, right? So there are different components of that, depending on what area of the organization, whether you're in maintenance or whether you're in the operations department. So there'll be more sub metrics that people will just focus on, but they automatically line up. So you line them up in the system in a way that the data rolls up so that it can create this indices, then that allows management to see how well the organization is doing. Um, we started to do that at Bridges and Tunnels already. So we were able to build a framework, but we didn't get the implementation until, you know, because the MTA had this massive consolidation and so forth. So it changed the whole operating model totally yeah. uh, for, for the business support function. So that is moving towards the center now. Yeah, that's yeah. like the next, one of the yeah. next phases of what we're trying to do out there. And it's, it's interesting because it's, I think it's much more of a culture change than anything. And right. um, so just those learning pains and growing pains that come with it. But I think that people want it. It's just the change piece that people still continue to wrap right. with. So. And that those conversations are so important. They're I so mean, important. I, I had so many sidebars and, and hallway conversations just to to get people to understand um, what was happening. And you know, the transformation itself, the organizational transformation was the transformation of business support functions. That's really what all they were doing is consolidating all the business support functions to the center. Asset management was the operational transformation that was already in flight, but people never realized that. And then people also did not quite understand that you did have to link those two types of transformations together, right? to enable that outcome that everybody wanted to see. Yep. So which is why we did build the transformation plan in a way 
that looked at life cycle management, whether you are um, hired to retire in the HR department, hired to retire should be a big process that should be looked at and transform that. Supply chain from strategic sourcing all the way to inventory management. And then you have, of course, asset management, which is your whole project life cycle, asset management life cycle. Once people started seeing life cycle management outside of engineering and maintenance, right? They were like, wow. And then you, you made your connectors through the framework that we built. You're able to now see those connecting points across the different layers, right? Whether it's through processes, whether it's through data, um, by function and across the organization. So what we ended up having, and we always said this, is that we had a BIM model for the MTA. So that's really what's in place right now. You could see it in ARIS, that's the software um, that we used. And you could see it three-dimensionally all these different components at work, it's continuously iterated on. People are conducting projects, you know, they're carrying out all the different process re-engineering work, um, systems implementations, they're populating this. Um, and the key thing I wanted to mention is cybersecurity. So one of the key things that, that the MP wanted to focus on was cybersecurity, right, in, as part of the transformation. And, People are like, we have no clue where our operational systems are. And we're like, yes, you have a way to know where they are. Here it is, because there was an early mapping of key operational systems at a very high level. But again, it truncated the process of discovery and assessment so that you were able to identify, you know, what's the suite of operational systems that the agencies were kind of hoarding. They didn't want to tell headquarters exactly because they were going to lose control in terms of how they were going to be able to, to operate and maintain it. So they didn't want central IT to take over. But this, uh, this made it transparent. So again, um, it was used for the cybersecurity planning to identify what systems were had. And then from then on, obviously more confidential planning was gonna happen, but at least you had the full set and suite of assets that you have for cybersecurity. So anyway. Thinking about the hack that happened at um, Colorado DOT, have you addressed cybersecurity in your asset management? Yeah. Not in the way that we should have, but it was. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. That's Not good. You're having a conversation. That's what we wanted. Oh, no. Conversation in front of I, I was just asking because um, Colorado DOT had kind of an infamous uh, hack of their systems a few years back. And I was asking if Denver had sort of taken those lessons to heart oh. as they set up their asset management program. I So it's typically handled by technology services, which is at the city level. But it'd be curious to know, or it'd be really interesting to know at least, um, there may have been action like immediately afterwards, but I, it was before my time, but nonetheless, but to that I'll point. I'll send you the report that came out of it, but it might <laughs> sort of say, just because you might see some names that are yeah, useful. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a lesson learned there in their backyard, literally across the street, so. Even then, uh, what was it last year, the Colonial Pipeline hack? Yeah. Oh, wow, that was, that. those types of things have the ability to really, to truly just bring the country to the knees because it's such a strategic important asset, so. I have a question. Why is it that the transportation sector seems to be, or not just seems to be, is clearly so much further ahead in asset management than any of the other sectors? I know water is somewhere trying to, trying to catch up, but transportation, and I don't know if this, I think Mildred, you said before MAP21, you guys were already on that path. We were, I mean, but that's because the Bridges and Tunnels Agency, you know, had like a mandated reporting uh, on, you know, biannual inspection requirements. Um, and then we report to FHWA, um, you know, for the scorecard. I think we, we a couple of our facilities actually appear uh, on that federal list of whatever deficient deteriorated um, bridges. So, um, so because of that mandate, one organization was actually further ahead and had an, uh, an asset management system in place. It was manual. It didn't really have um, all the systems. So when the MTA went full force into an enterprise um, system, that's when you know we then were able to say, at least we've done some of the work. We already had very good 
manual processes documented. So it's a matter of saying, here are the requirements and you're able now to integrate. Um, but MAP21 is actually the kicker for um, the other, the transit properties, transit and rail organizations of the MTA, because it, does, it did require NTD reporting to be um, more robust. It also required the asset management plans to be developed for the first time. So those were the initiatives that actually kicked the organization into the gear of, uh, we're now in the asset management mode, but there was still a, a, a communication issue of the, the perception of asset management and always, we, we do that already. I don't know what you're talking about. Why is it so different, right? Until you look at what an asset management plan looks like, Right. And then you realize, well, there's there's also a section there, even at the very minimum from a financial perspective, there's a financial section there on how that actually translates the condition of your assets into the future, uh, your backlogs and so forth. Right. So uh, I think it's MAP 21 that actually has um, when you have a regulation in place, I think it, it, it compels organizations to to follow and do something about it. So Amy, do you understand why that happened at the federal level? Yes. Well, USDOT slash Federal Highway has a uh, control over the funding. So uh, you either follow the rules or you don't get your funding. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of yes. straightforward. So anything that's on the, uh, the um, defense system or on the national um, highway network, you have to provide information on pavements and bridges, but that's it, just pavements and bridges. So that's one of the things that while we know a lot about pavements and bridges, we don't know a lot about our culvert system, our drainage systems, our ITS systems, our where our um, yeah. uh, fiber is. We don't yeah. know a lot of where that is. We don't know the condition of many, but bridges and pavements, we have pretty nailed because we've been required to do that for many, many years. USDOT, Federal Highway Administration. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's part of the transportation bills. It's been in place for a number of years, but the the bridge and the bridges in particular, because of the fact that they're carrying populations over, you know, bodies of water, it's required that you have some sort of structural understanding of how they're performing. So that's been in place for years. That's part of the national bridge inventory and um, inspections. The other every, yes. every two years, you know, having got to inspections, pavements have come along behind that. Um, we have a pretty robust pavement program right now. We don't know a ton about you know things like slopes and uh, you know geo the assets that we own. I know Colorado Department of Transportation looks at their uh, geo uh, geotechnical assets as assets, and they actually maintain and, and sort of look at the condition of them and report on them in their asset management program, which is kind of unique. Um, but asset management's come along tremendously in in the field of transportation, in particular highways, kind of leading the way. Rail coming along behind that, but um, it's just something that that we've been kind of ingrained, I, I wouldn't say it's perfect. I would say, well, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress and yeah. it will always continue to be a work in progress. But I think that the transportation industry as a whole in many different sectors, there's a lot of asset intensive industries within transportation that I think that it requires a way of thinking about asset management and to varying levels more than a lot of other industries. And so I think that that other than the fact that I think transportation is better than all the other industries, but <laughs> Um, other than that, I think that um, that probably is the sort of the lead linchpin on sort of why and everything that was said here uh, just a minute ago. Well, one thing that's, David, do you have? Yeah. Um, I think that the I'm not sure this is To answer your question, I think what, what, what we found in the water industry that I think all your transportation that had in terms of asset management. Yeah, transportation one is above ground, it's visible. They have tiny tables, they have painting activities that are fixing the bubbles, they interact with the public. The public understands the value of transportation and how they get from point A to point B. Uh, you know, so I think I think it's been instilled the magnitude of the money and the size of the projects. I think that's why they're much further along with just asset management principles and the concept of value to the public. Um, water or berry were kind of first in for how we got for free because it's sky. Uh, you know, it's like that, that's part of the problem. Um, you know, you know, so I was just gonna say, but, but what's also interesting, they do have subsurface and in Colorado DOT, there's a plug for ASCE, they're the first 
uh, state institutions to adopt ASC 3802, which is on, on buried assets. So from the standards organization, I think DOT is super, you know, talk about standards. So I, I think that's why they're, they're definitely further along. Um, as far as transportation being the best industry, just remind you, in Colorado, 80% of your water is on the Western slope. So Denver grows, you know, <laughs> you may be you may be interested in knowing it from an international perspective it's interesting because in japan there's a big emphasis on water regulation of water in the uk and actually past 55 got started because of energy problems in the energy sector and it was safety driven and then i know in uh in the netherlands safety was a big issue there too and that and that they set up a requirement for a essentially it's like ISO 55,000. It's I can't remember it's in something or other, um, which is which is a, a regulation that is effectively requires asset management, but it's it's because of safety issues. So it's it's so interesting when you look around the world and you see the different perspectives that that various countries have about um, about asset management, and it's all, and it tends to be driven by a perception of what's critical infrastructure. And so, and and it's kind of disappointing to me in this country we haven't gotten there yet, other than transportation. It's very true because water, for example. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but for water, for example, it's like people don't really. The only time they sliverly think about water is when you see what's happening in Jackson and, and Flint. And then water is important, but. We really we need to be thinking about it much more than that. So, I think it also depends on your unique uh, situation. I mean, if you talk to Singapore about water, you know, it's a big thriving economy, the center of Asia Pacific, but they actually don't have their own water. You know, they they get water from uh, Malaysia and and they try to desalinize it and all of all kinds of things. But imagine, right? And and Japan is very high on any any of the environmental uh, friendly aspects you know i mean you look at how they recycle things you know everything is there like five categories of recycling so i mean you don't find paper like we use paper here so just, yeah so I, I got a little different different take is uh, earl mentioned uh, asset intensive organizations personally i've, I've been on a little mission to use the word asset centric because to me a restaurant is an asset intensive organization but you know understand what we mean but uh, i was sitting here listening to the conversation and oddly my my brain went to a recent old movie i watched with my wife my big fat greek wedding <laughs> it's one of those movies that everybody's seen right yeah you know? but remember you know the greek father grandfather whatever it was I always went back to something Greek, right? You know, whatever it is, it went back to something Greek. So I think we're all kind of afraid to say that especially in asset intensive or asset centric organizations, what's the difference between the organization and asset management? I, to me, it's the spirit of the organization is asset management, especially if it's an asset intensive organization. It is as asset management is, and in, in fact, when we were we were talking a lot about uh, the digital transformations that were going on, every every you know the, the people who understood asset management said asset management is a transformation. Um, so it's it's the heart and soul because you know you use your assets to deliver services. Without your assets, you can't deliver transportation services. So that's the core um, for transit organizations. Yeah. Excellent. We've got Ivan and then a special, uh, and then Michael, and then a special guest. Okay, so um, Jack, that was a great question. Really a good discussion. Oh, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to piggyback on that. I mean, you're seeing transportation professionals up at the table here. Another big piece of that, I think, has been the capacity building that DOT has done to support the legislation. I mean, it started in pre previous bills with the condition and performance requirement, but in MAP 21, 
asset management plans, but along with that has been a lot of guidebooks and training. That's that partnership with, you know, Ashto and, and research and, and just helping trainings, helping professionals uh, really be able to utilize that in, in their fields. And so I think that that capacity building is really important and is something we could be thinking about for other um, sectors as well. I'll just chime in for one second on that. I, I was a professor at George Mason University for 11 years, and Ooh. I always go back to how would I ever explain these concepts to an undergrad? Yeah. And so I've been having a lot of conversations with other professors or former professors about where could we sort of plug this in? Because it's hard to add to the curriculum if anybody's gone through accreditation with ASCE. We don't have a lot of room to squeeze in another course on asset management. But thinking about how we could, you know, put a module in, you know, engineering economics, for example, just to at least touch undergrads at least once so that they see these concepts and not everybody's going to run out and build a bridge when they graduate, you know, or, or you know, stand up a brand new wastewater system, but probably most of you are going to have to deal with managing a system. So what does that mean? What are performance metrics and what are some of the things that you have to worry about? And so we've been thinking about ways that we can sort of plug in resilience and performance measures you know, as a, as a module within engineering economics, if nothing else. I was listening to the conversation, particularly Earl's thinking about his forward plan. And we've also been talking about how we can kind of do some forward planning. And when we talked about that difference between, when you guys mentioned the difference between transportation and water, and then we introduced how different uh, uh, parts of the world treat it differently. There's a, it really fundamentally comes down to this question of culture. Right, the cultures are different in these places, and transportation forced a little bit of a culture change. Uh, but then it got, I was thinking about the conversation about stewardship, right? And I think the big cultural change that we have to all embrace is, is the culture of stewardship, stewardship of our physical assets, stewardship of our natural assets. And for the purposes of providing generationals of assets and services that can sustain them over the long term. And so uh, the question I would like to challenge everyone to think about is how do we introduce a culture of stewardship into the United States, into all of our asset classes, and the value systems that's associated with intergenerational responsibilities? Um, any thoughts on, I mean, anyone want to take up those challenges or where do we go from, go from here, I guess is the question as we get towards the end of this workshop today. I'll just chime in real quick. I had a um, former colleague who used to say it was civil engineering is a noble profession. And thinking about sort of the next generation of kids and what are the things that sort of stimulate them and excite them. And, and certainly climate change is one of the things that they worry about. So understanding how climate engages with infrastructure and what that means in terms of maintaining infrastructure for services and the population at large, I think is something that could be interesting and a new way to kind of spur energy into civil engineering and into engineering in, in general. Um, that might be something to kind of get their excitement peaked and thinking about being a noble, you know, supporter and, and maintainer of these critical infrastructures. And the ASC is doing this project around uh, future uh, vision, future world visions, where they're starting to say, we can envision futures that are sustainable. And we as young engineers, you as young engineers, can make that happen, that's your job. So I would hope uh, us as asset managers can also champion that responsibility of stewardshipping the future or birthing the future. That is uh, something that they're wanting to live in and that the role of us as asset managers are putting in systems where those values can be executed uh, uh, generation after generation, I suspect. Excellent. And we have a special guest that we're able to beam in who might be able to address that also. Last night, uh, Mildred was asking, how is the president of Strategies in Sight, uh, Cecilia Moa? And uh, if everything goes right, she'll be joining us momentarily. I am here. Good afternoon. I am here. How are how is everyone? I wish I were there with you guys, but I have been with you since this morning and enjoying every moment of the presentations and the thought leadership that the ALN has assembled here today. It's fabulous. Everything that you guys are talking about is on point. And this panel especially was very helpful for me because I wanted to hear 
more of the intangible assets and Mildred raised some of what we can do with ISO 55000 as a standard, the sort of scope creep that we heard um, Art talk about that university health saw it happen when you got certified and moved into utilizing this standard, this common vocabulary that Richard discussed. And then you became aware of what your priorities were and your needs. In listening to you guys on this panel right now, um, I was wondering if one of the differences with transportation is the fact that it is so close to the end user as an issue so that we get to the point where we can look at the, you know, what is the value? An asset is something of value to an organization. Well, to the transportation departments, the question is value for who and why and when, and making sure that you're doing what you've got to do. And I loved your example that you gave Mildred of what happened with the pandemic and moving forward into being aware of who the and who all the employees were, who were the players that are doing what needs to be done to get the organization's mission cared for. And that's so critical. And looking at culture, changing the culture by being aware of everyone's value, because everyone that works in each of our organizations is an asset in the sense of being a relationship to the organization. It's in either a productive way or in a consumption way, you've got that. And so I'd love to hear you guys talk more about stakeholder collaboration. And Amy, I wanna give you a shout out for mentioning universities because that's the one thing we haven't had much of here that's a collaborator that we really need to be looking to to make a difference so that we too can be seen as the, um, the flavor of the day, just like ESG has become the flavor of the day. Asset management ought to be becoming more of a flavor of the day. We tell the story here. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and more of what your thoughts are on stakeholder involvement. Since 4.2, takes you right there after looking at mission. You want to take a crack at it? <laughs> Hi, Cecilia. I was just asking about you today. So uh, it's great to see you. Um, yeah, um, so uh, to go back to the MTA example, um, when the pandemic hit, I mean, it was really chaotic because for the first time, the disaster, so to speak, was not a, a climate disaster or something wherein physical assets were damaged. It's people were damaged, right? People were dropping like flies. They were getting infected. They can't come to work. And all of a sudden, how do you continue to provide those services, right? Um, transportation services with the workforce that you have and you couldn't even predict. You couldn't tell who's gonna be sick tomorrow and when they're gonna be able to return back. And so that was really a huge, um, that was a huge challenge um, for, for our organization. Um, but it, it compelled um, the leadership to really better understand then who do we have and what are the different roles that we have within operations, right? Are there teams that could substitute for you know, another group, right? And those are things that if you had a normal planning process, you would have that ready to go. See, now that we know those plans are in place, they have a better um, understanding of their workforce and what the capabilities are of the different segments of the operational workforce so that they can deploy in the event something like this happens. But it took something unprecedented like the pandemic to really um, make you think and say, okay, we really have a gap here because this type of role, you know, we can't fulfill. So pandemic cleaning. So one of the things when you think about pandemic cleaning, I mean, we had, we had workforce, you know, we had people that really clean, but it was a different kind of cleaning process, right? It required, you know, use of, you know, tools, technology, 
right? So we really had to supplement that with external contracts to bring them in to, to help while training those that are there because we knew that pandemic cleaning or that type of cleaning would be a requirement for some time to come. I mean, maybe we do less of it in the future, but it was still something brand new that had to be put in. Again, a new capability within operations. Um, and then going back to the model, putting that in as a new capability and understanding that in the new process so that now you can plan for how you're going to make sure you have the staff in place, the resources in place to mobilize, um, you know, when things like this happen. So, um, I mean, I know that that's, you know, that was one of the things that we, you know, we did. But I, do you have anything to add? I think that, um, when it comes to the work that we do at the DOT, all our constituency obviously is all the residents and the businesses within the city and county of Denver. And I think a lot of the things, uh, particularly transit related, actually really DOT related and transit related here over the last few years, because at the depths of the pandemic, I was in the Chicago Transit Authority. Yeah. And so a lot of those things are very, in many ways, still fresh something very brand new, electrostatic cleaning. What is that? Yes. And like, it, it was just a lot of different things. And then, um, you know, but still at the DOT level, you know, since we're responsible for solid waste management and uh, wastewater management and other sort of public facing services, um, people, a lot of these people, a lot of these functions, you need, you need people and having them understand and uh, going through this, it was a very, it was a trying time. And, you know, we had people out sick and still have, a, have quite a few vacancies, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the importance of being adaptable and um, being in a nimble as a possible place you can, uh, hopefully will help uh, overcome that over time. But that's, that's one example also, and the one that you gave also is uh, when it comes to sort of asset leadership, that is where I think a lot of it is really sort of put to the test. I'll just add on uh, thinking about sort of stakeholder involvement and, and one of the things in transportation I think that we haven't done yet that we need to do is that asset managers typically are one or two people in an organization. And it seems kind of strange that we have our bridge group and our pavement group, but the asset manager, management um, person of the DOT is usually one or two people. So we, I had an exercise recently in a project with the Utah Department of Transportation to try to sort of build consensus for this concept of asset management. And we brought in maintenance staff, which there was about 10 of them in the room. And I was telling Jim the story <laughs> earlier. Um, there's about 10 of them in a workshop and we had engineers and executives there as well. So it always makes maintenance staff uncomfortable when they're in the room with those people who they feel like are gonna pick on their ideas. But we took um, blank maps of US 40 in uh, Utah and, and asked them, you know, circle areas on the map that, that cause you problems. You know, things that you're out there repeatedly fixing or you know, there's water over the road or there's, there's debris, there's something that's going on that's constantly happening. And what we were trying to demonstrate through the exercise with them is that we're not trying to supplement their expertise, but we're trying to help them uh, support it with data sets that may be available from people like USGS or FEMA. And so after they did their exercise where they circled the, um, the areas that caused them problems or high risk areas would be one, that you, one way that you would, we would think about it. We layered uh, Mylar over the top of them and we had printed out the um, FEMA flood maps and the USGS rockfall areas. And what we showed them was that about 85% of the time, what they thought was a problem was also what the data sets were showing. And so that kind of helped to build some, some buy-in from that level of people that we really need them to understand that it's important that you convey up the chain what's happening on your day-to-day -day business, because that helps us inform where to make the investments to give you the support that you need to clean out that culvert four times a year instead of two times a year. And so thinking about asset management, kind of not just with the executives and with decision makers, but also the boots on the ground, I think type people is important. And that was, I think that was one of the most rewarding things I've had happen to me in the past five or 10 years. And just seeing their faces light up to say, yeah, we know what we're talking about and the data is supporting it as well from these national data sets who may have never stepped foot in our state, but we're, we're all on the same page. And so I think that kind of helped to build buy-in for asset management at the maintenance level. 